Welcome to Understanding Climate with Professor Monks. Today's topic, climate models. British statistician George E. P. Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is not a knock on modeling. Rather, it should remind us of the purpose of science. Science is about helping us interact successfully with the world around us, and models can be useful for that purpose. A climate model is a mathematical representation of the processes making up the Earth's climate system. Climatologists rely heavily on models since we can't easily or ethically do experiments on the entire climate system. But if we have a reliable model, we can use it to test out what would happen if we made changes to the climate system. A climate model is built based on observations of the Earth's climate system and on scientific theories that describe how the system operates the kind of observations and theories we've been looking at in this series. A climate model is usually composed of submodels that simulate the processes in the atmosphere, the land, the ocean, and the ice sheets. Then a coupler links them all together, passing effects from one sphere on to another. It's important to distinguish climate models from weather models. Meteorologists use weather models to predict tomorrow's weather, but a climate model is not just a weather model that's run for a long time. Weather models are very fine scale, showing a lot of geographical detail. They're often regional in extent. For example, a weather model might cover just the lower 48 United States. And because weather models are run for short time periods, they tend to ignore snow slower, longer term changes, such as alterations in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. By contrast, climate models represent the entire world, but at a much coarser spatial scale. They can't tell you what's going to happen in your hometown versus the next town over. They're also run for long time scales. Remember how we've been talking about climate changes going out to the year 2100 or even longer. And because of that, climate models are very interested in these slower changes like greenhouse gas emissions that change the overall radiative forcing of the Earth. The simplest type of model is one we've already looked at, an energy balance model. A simple energy balance model treats the Earth as a single place and adds up the incoming and outgoing radiation. The equation you see here is an energy balance model. L, the solar irradiance or energy coming from the sun, times one minus alpha or the average albedo, divided by four to account for the fact that the sun illuminates a circle while the earth radiates out from a sphere, equals epsilon, which tells you whether the earth will admit at all possible wavelengths, times sigma, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the earth's temperature to the fourth power. You don't need to remember all of that, but it shows how a single equation can capture one crucial process in the climate system. As we learned earlier, this equation tells us that the Earth should be about negative 18 degrees Celsius. That's actually true of the very top of our atmosphere, but it clearly isn't the case for the surface of the Earth, so we need to add more to our models to represent other processes. As we add features to our model, we start to create what's known as an Earth Model of Intermediate Complexity, or EMIC. An EMIC incorporates more processes than just energy in and out, things like the greenhouse effect, the carbon cycle, and ocean circulation. An EMIC also starts to incorporate geography. Rather than treating the Earth as a single point, an EMIC includes information on the arrangement of land, ocean, and ice-covered areas, and looks at how different places on the Earth interact. For example, we know the intensity of solar radiation at the Earth's surface is higher near the equator, where the light comes straight down, than at the poles where it's spread out. This energy imbalance leads to flows of warm air and water from the equator towards the poles, which an EMIC can account for. Finally, our most complex models are called general circulation models. A GCM tries to simulate the full set of processes across all the spheres that make up our Earth. The future climate projections in the IPCC's reports are generated using GCMs. It's important to remember that more complex models are not always better. A simpler model can be easier to use and can take up a lot less time to run than a more complex one. A GCM represents the Earth as a grid of cells. This is kind of like how, if you zoom way in on a digital photo, you can see that it's made up of colored squares or pixels. A GCM tracks the state of each cell, for example, its temperature, and its interaction with other cells, for example, warm air flowing from one cell to its colder neighbor. Cells are three-dimensional, so the atmosphere and ocean consist of stacks of cells from top to bottom. A GCM also divides up time into discrete blocks, moving the climate system forward one step at a time. The spatial resolution tells us how big the cells are. 
Higher resolution means smaller cells that show more detail, like a high resolution TV screen. The models used in the IPCC's first assessment report back in 1995 generally had cells that were about 500 kilometers to a side. Current GCMs have cells about 100 kilometers to a side. When you increase the spatial resolution, you also have to increase the temporal resolution, the size of the time steps. This is because, say, an ocean current moving water from one place to another will reach the next cell much quicker if the cell is 100 kilometers across than if it's 500 kilometers across. A major constraint on the resolution of climate models is computer processing power. Doubling the resolution of a model increases the number of calculations that have to be made by a factor of 16. You have twice as many cells east to west, twice as many north to south, times twice as many up and down, times twice as many in time. Luckily, computers have been getting more and more powerful every year. Your web browser can run climate models that re would require a dedicated supercomputer back in the early 90s. We can test a model by trying to predict the past, then comparing the results to what really happened. If a model is good at predicting past climate, we can trust that it will be reliable in predicting future climate. This is known as hindcasting. When we look at model outputs, we often see a wide band with a range of outcomes. This is because a GCM has a certain random element in it, matching the random elements of a real world, so it doesn't produce exactly the same result every time. Climatologists usually run their models a bunch of times, then show the average output and a range of outputs. The IPCC goes even further, combining the outputs for several different models. Here we see a range of outputs from models hindcasting the global temperatures for the last century. When we add the actual observed temperatures, we can see that the models did a pretty good job. The real temperatures are very close to the modeled ones. Although the models didn't capture the exact ups and downs of every year, they got the overall trajectory, rising from about, until about 1950, falling a bit over the next few decades, then rising steeply, basically right. We get a similarly good fit when we look at the results just for particular regions of the world. So we know our models aren't just getting lucky by overestimating temperatures in one place and underestimating them elsewhere so that the errors cancel out. Once our hindcasts confirm that our model is a good one, we can use it to forecast the future. Here, we need to draw on our emission scenarios that we talked about in the last video. Forecasting is a game of what if. What happens to our global temperature if we put in certain anthropogenic forcings? Here you see the projected temperature changes from some of these representative concentration pathway scenarios. You can see that RCP 2.6 keeps temperatures to about a one degree anomaly relative to pre-industrial times, or in other words, about the same warming we've already seen. But recall that to get a radiative forcing of 2.6 watts per meter squared, that scenario had to envision pretty significant and rapid cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, RCP 8.5 takes us to about 4 degrees of warming by 2100. But both of these projections have a range of possibilities. So in some model runs, RCP 8.5 only gives us 3.5 degrees of warming, while in others we get nearly 5 degrees of warming. Our climate models can predict more than just global temperature. Here we see predicted sea level rise. We'll talk about the processes behind sea level rise in a later video. Our models indicate that RCP 8.5 will likely produce something like three quarters of a meter of sea level rise by 2100, whereas RCP 2.6 would keep it to a little under half a meter. Again, there are significant ranges of uncertainty around these predictions. GCMs can also show us how changes will differ from place to place on the Earth. Here we see a map of temperature anomalies in the year 2100 under the RCP 8.5 scenario. You can see that temperature rises are predicted to be higher in the Arctic than in other parts of the world. And here's a map of changes in precipitation. Areas that are already dry are generally predicted to get drier, and those that are already wet will get wetter. This particular projection is specifically for the month of January because temperature Precipitation changes can be very different from month to month in areas that have significant seasonal differences in precipitation. 